Good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we will uh, call to order our work session, which is our um, precursor meeting to the meeting of September the 3rd, which will be our first, our regular meeting for September. Um, in our uh, work session, we're going to have a presentation by Mr. Ashford, and Matt Peterson has joined us for the, from the Stennis Institute to give us an overview of the uh, salary survey and the study results that they did, which we greatly appreciate. Thank you for, for doing that, and thank you for being here on a, on a long a holiday weekend for a Friday. So um, now I'm just going to turn it over to you and let you proceed. Good deal. Thank you, Mayor and Board, for allowing us to have the opportunity to go over the data um, for the salary study. Um, as you say, this is Matt Peterson. Matt is a research associate with the Stennis Institute, and so I'm going to turn it over to him first and let him kind of give you all an idea of all the data that we had collected through the study and let him talk about that. Okay. Sure. sure. Uh, thank you all for having me. Thank, thank you all for allowing me to do the study. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I think spring of 2017, we conducted a full-scale study. Uh, we surveyed 73 uh, different cities around the southeast. Uh, we received back 38 municipalities. So it was a full-scale type of salary survey. Uh, what we did here was sort of the opposite of that. What we did here was we were looking for a more targeted search. Uh, we picked uh, 14 uh, specific um, agencies. I think it was 11 municipalities and three water and light companies. Um, so essentially what we did was we were trying to get better results for better comparables by hitting a more direct hit uh, toward the comparables to the uh, city of Starkville and uh, specifically the job titles you all have within the city of Starkville. Uh, so that was sort of our charge. Um, so essentially you're getting more of what you're looking for instead of a full scale just generality of a bunch of different cities, you're getting something much more targeted. Um, in your handout here in the binder, if you go to page four, Uh, this is essentially the, uh, the 14 respondents that we received. Uh, Nav and I, we uh, essentially determined these are the 14 closest that we could we could work with. That would actually give us the give us the, the data that we were looking for. That was more specific to the to the job titles that we had within the city of Starkville. So, Joel, it's page four. Yeah, there you go. <coughs> uh, we got a few from the Memphis area, a few from the Jackson area, uh, but more importantly, we got uh, Columbus. Uh, Tupelo, uh, Oxford, Tuscaloosa. Uh, we we're trying to get more uh, SEC towns as well as towns that had a similar population. So that was sort of the two, the, the two parameters we were looking for. Uh, additionally, for a lot of utility positions, we looked at Columbus Water and Light, uh, New Albany Water and Light, and uh, West Point Water and Light. Um, so that, that also gave us a much more, uh, much more accurate uh, measure of data in terms of salaries. Um, if you kind of look in, I'll give you an example here. If you look at page uh, nine. AJ, AJ, I'm sorry. If you look at like engineering, for example, the the data we were looking at primarily, uh, we wanted to get a survey mean or a survey average. Uh, so I calculated the mean for every position. Uh, of course, we got the median, uh, the minimum maximum range of each position, uh, the number of responses out of the 14. That's how many uh, how many agencies actually had a matching response. Uh, and then, of course, the most important number right here is the percent to the mean. Uh, that's how close the city of Starkville was to the uh, to the folks who had a, a direct hit in terms of a, of a matching of a matching job title, uh, and then next to that, that's the dollar value difference of the percent to the mean. That's how short or high uh, you were in comparison to the survey mean itself. Uh, and then the table below that, the percentiles, that's sort of your bell curve. Um, it's uh, ten percent, of course, your entry level, all the way up to ninety percent, which is your more senior your more senior people in those positions. So we sort of did a, just a percentile. Uh, like I said, a bell curve uh, to determine the range of uh, the range of salaries uh, within each position. So um, I guess from here, or maybe even on Tuesday night, I can actually discuss every department in further detail. But uh, that's essentially just what you got here in front of you as the, uh, the department by department sort of a breakdown uh, for each of the salaries. Okay. I want to add to that. Um, I gave you a one page here to hand out mm -hmm. what was uh, accomplishments from this. Um, as he stated, we did more of a targeted search this year. I think our primary goal was to get within the 90 to 95 percentile of that of that mean based on the survey. And I think he was able to get there. So as a result of the data that he had presented to me, I then took that information and the spreadsheet that you have there, the cost data sheet, broke it down per department and per job in order to determine um, the salaries that were at the 90 percentile and what we needed to get to. And so some of the primary focuses and the results
results that we was able to achieve was changing the minimum wage for our labor employees to the $12 and anywhere from $12 and $12.07. We was able to focus on some of our positions that we have retention issues um, and hard to fill positions such as equipment operators, foremen, superintendents, the linemen position, police officers, and firefighters. And then we was also able to look at other comparable positions throughout the city with similar job duties that was lacking under the 90 percent we was able to make adjustment with those as well okay so linemen firefighters equipment operators um, superintendents. superintendents um and what else what else foreman okay and equipment operators would be in uh sanitation the street department and water department. okay all right, and problems in all of those in getting in getting folks. Yes, okay. Okay. Um, and you your spreadsheet's pretty extensive here. Yes, it's very detailed. Um, as you flip through it, I've also sent it out in the email. Um, the first couple sheets is what are the employees who are at the 90, anywhere from 90 to 95 percentile. So there's no recommendation for those employees on that sheet. Okay. Once you start turning it over and working it down by other departments, the employees that have a recommendation, you see they're highlighted in the grayish blue. And so those are all the recommendations um, below 90. that I'm proposing. Below the, the recommendations in shade or the 90 percent below. No, so the ones that are in gray are the ones that I have changed to get up to either 90%, anywhere between 90% and 95%. And that's already an adjusted figure that's inside the gray? It is. That's already been adjusted. And over to the right, it shows the far, far, far right column shows that increase, what that percentage increase is. So, is there any, any particular one that you feel like you need to highlight for any, anything? No particular one to highlight. I okay. think uh, based on the data that the Stennis Institute presented, I think we was able to get as close as between the 90 to 95 as we could. Um, and it's all based on whatever that position is. Um, a couple of them, um, like I say, in the alignment and the utilities department, um, I think we got there with some of the positions such as the linemen, the ones that are hard to fill or the ones that we're okay. losing you know, going to contract companies and things like that, I think with this adjustment, we'll be more competitive, competing with the market, um, and be able to retain some of the employees that we have. Okay. Well, one of, one of my concerns is, is obviously been, you know, lack of retention costs us money. It costs us in retraining, it costs us in time, it costs us in multiple ways. One of the things I asked NAV to do for me, and I did not send it out to y'all because I was being very thoughtless today, apparently, and otherwise occupied, but I had asked him to give me the turnover rate for us uh, for the last several years. In 2017, our average number of employees was 320. We had a num we had 83, which is an annual percentage turnover rate of 25.94, so we might as well say 26. In 2018, we had 315 employees. Number of turnover was 59, which is 18.73. And then 2019, we had three, we have, we're still in 2019, 325 with a turnover of 82, which is 25.23. So, um, and we're not out of 2019 yet. But a lot of that, and the preponderance of them are police, fire, and linemen. I'm going to ask that specifically. I know the previous board had a lot of talk on police and fire and the amount of turnover there was. Has that decreased by any percentage? I'll say three or four years ago that y'all know of, or is it still? It seems like we have a lot of turnover in police and fire. I and mean, what's the situation? We've been adjusting salaries now for years. Is it something internal? Is it a personnel issue? Is um, I, I think it's probably multiple things. Um, in, in the fire department, a lot of times we've had some people most recently who've gone to join or followed spouses or followed girlfriends or whatever. Um, and we've had police who've done the same thing. We've had. Um, People have gone back down to be with family. Uh, the linemen are going to places that are currently under construction due to hurricanes and you know weather events and those sorts of things. So they're they're getting extra amounts of uh, overtime and things that would greatly increase their salary or their compensation opportunities. And I asked them in doing this, you know, I said, are any of these linemen coming back? But no, there continue to be issues where they're having to respond to. You know the construction opportunities are there for them so um this is at least to get to the point terry do you have any long-term linemen um that you've recently lost or any that you know 
that you're concerned about losing just in terms of? Yeah, we probably got two that we're going to be losing in the next 18 months or so. Okay. Or that's going to be here for a while. Yeah. But, you know, what we've tried to do is kind of grow ours. Right. And then, like you said, I think retention is the key part because most every week or when the contractors come through, they're coming and asking these guys come come work with us because they're just going to have to Right. That is right. a real challenge. Yeah. Well, I mean, our health package, health benefit package is better than most. Am, am I correct in saying that now? That's correct. Okay. So it's not so much that, it's that immediate compensation piece that people see. And so I'm really, I'm, I really think that this salary increase proposal is extremely important for us to move forward with because I think it's, you know, our employees are what sets the tone for the city all, all the way around from, from the sanitation worker who says hi to the people that are picking their trash up to the police officer who's either pulling them over or, or just on the street and being visible to them. So um, I really think it, it would serve us well to at least be within the 90-95% percentile, which is what NAV was instructed to provide. Um, as we're moving forward with this. So to me, this, um, this budget is intended to be the supporting factor for our employees this time around. And I'm, I'm really hoping that the board will uh, consider it. So uh, questions of either NAV? Um, and, and I'd like to, to tag on to that just a little bit. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I, I think the retention piece of it is enormous and it does cost us in training cost and productivity of our other staff as they're being pulled away to help when you have new employees um, and, and then it just costs us tremendously when we have a retention issue. The other, the other thing about getting to these levels of pay is it improves our applicant pool because I know that sometimes we will have a job opening and we just don't have people that are interested in applying for them um, because, because the pay is not sufficient. Our benefits are great, but for a lot of people that's, that's not an immediate um, return to them and so, so compensation does become an important part of it. When we developed the budget, we, we knew that NAV was going to be wrapping this um, study up. And so um, if, if y'all remember back to the budget work session a couple of meetings ago, we talked about what it would take to include this in, in, um, the, in, the, in fiscal year 20. And, and it unfortunately does take a, a tax increase. There's this, hiring two additional firemen so that we can finally fully open um, um, Fire Station 5, um, providing some additional IT um, equipment and supplies that are geared toward public safety and keeping our city records safe. Uh, which well, is I like that a little bit more because with all the um, blackmail or whatever. Ransomware. We, yeah, ransomware going out there, lots and lots of folks are being hit. And the most recent one was Texas, is that not That's true, Joel? Yeah, so you know there are some there are some significant things that are that are in this budget to keep us to keep us safe in ways that will may not be visible unless we were to hit. In which case, then you'd go, well, why didn't we? You know, right. so and it's it that very much is a pay me now or pay me later kind of thing. You can take the risk and not not spend the money now, but then you're you're tagged with hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars of, of ransom that's being dem demanded while while your city services essentially are shut down. Um, and then um, as, as we become a more data-driven uh, community and as, as we have a lot more um, video type things that we need to store, our storage needs go up. So um, I, I too support, support this. Um, I think that we can, with the proposed tax increase, we can do this certainly by April, depending on how other expenses are occurring, it's possible that we could, we could do it in January. I was hoping for October. No. Well, we could, we could potentially do it if you'd like to do a larger tax increase. Well, <laughs> but, I... But. Uh, this the, the, we can, we can the, delay. I just by, by, by delaying it, it incorporates what Alderman Carver likes to see frequently, which is growing into some of these things. So you either do a, a slightly larger tax increase and start immediately in October, or you delay the start January. and and um, the the what you what you have put together would work for the first opportunity would be January. We first, just cover the first that. opportunity. You tell all your personnel increases in January. 
was by you know, well, and obviously, you know, the, the folks who are at the at the bottom of the pay scale, you know, they clearly, clearly need to come up. So, anyway. We, we talk about that and, and say that we want to be able to provide a living wage and um, $12 as, as a minimum wage is, is a, a better than a lot of places here in town, but I, I don't think any of us would really want to try to have to live. Well, that's With really that a starting. Living it's a starting wage, wage. Yeah, as and, opposed to a family living wage. Yeah, and then they have they have opportunities to to increase that as they um, work through promotion processes. So okay. Those laborers, but that's important too. So. Sure. Okay. All so, right. Go ahead. Yes. Um, no, I'm I'm certainly supportive of, of looking at the the numbers and figuring out how do we how do we accomplish this and how soon can we accomplish this. But coming back to the progression plan that has been passed, not. How do you see this um, beginning? Because one of the things that I believe that I read in the little excerpt that you sent out, Nab, was that we have too many different job titles and so forth, um, and that this might be a way to collapse some of those so we have fewer job titles and more consistent uh, across departments. Um, how, how does this study and what you're proposing uh, in here to the board, how does that translate to thinking about what the progression plans are going to be or are we moving away from that model? No, we're continuing the progression plan. Um, as I stated in the email, I would like to keep some of the levels, but currently, say for instance, we have maintenance work of one, two, and three. Looking around at other municipalities, there's too many classifications. And so my recommendation in talking to some of the department heads, we're going to eliminate the mid-level maintenance worker on two, and just basically have a maintenance worker on one and maintenance. Well, in theory, we have two levels: <laughs> right. maintenance worker one and maintenance worker two, but not a maintenance worker three because we don't see that that being a need. And the same for equipment operator: um, eliminating that middle level and just keeping one equipment operator one and equipment operator two, and same as for foreman. There's really not a lead a need for a lead foreman have form in and then form in two because those there's not enough distinguishing difference and responsibilities so there's just no need for all those different levels so it will require us to adjust the, the plan that we already have in place but we're basically just eliminating that middle position in the progression plan. And so as a way to move forward in this uh, lockstep so everything's together while we're beginning to plan in this current budget fiscal year for how we're going to integrate this do those things need to be approved uh, concurrently so that we're making sure that everything is working uh, in tandem. I have put all of that into the study. Okay. Um, once the study was approved, my plan was to just update the progression plan. But I've already included my, you know, the proposal within this area. So all I would have to do is that if this is approved, I would just update the progression plan. Thank you. Okay. Did all three of those two have had different, different, different wages? Yes, one, sir. two, and three of different wages. And yes, sir. Cur for currently, like a maintenance worker one, um, start out at ten dollars an hour. The recommendation in this plan is to move it to twelve dollars an hour. And then for the maintenance worker two, currently is ten fifty. And then maintenance worker three was eleven fifty. So my proposal was to change the maintenance worker one to the twelve dollars as the starting salary, and then the maintenance worker two level would be $13, and that's incorporated in here as well. Um, and what that's doing is before the employee moves to an equipment operator three, they've been in that position for a year. Uh, in that progression plan, there's a couple of requirements that they have to uh, follow, meet the qualifications, the skill sets, or whatever that position is, and then they continue to move up into that next progression. And so for the equipment operator one, that starting salary was $14. The recommendation in this proposal is to take it to 15, and it's the same process. They have to be in that position for a certain amount of time before they move to the next level. So keeping the same progression as the progression plan states is just basically eliminating one of the levels. Any other questions? Questions? We got we got the the experts here, so. And so I'm assuming you're going to come give a talk to the full board on, on Tuesday night about the, the study, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And if there's any more detail you'd like me to provide on Tuesday, just, just please let me know and I'll be sure we can do that for the Tuesday discussion. Okay, all right. Anybody have anything else they want them to, to add to the study? 
gives him one day. Yeah. <laughs> gives him Tuesday. Oh, to do it. <laughs> it is a holiday on Monday after all. Okay. Um, and now what you just what you were just talking about, perhaps you put a quick narrative together about the progression plan and how it fits okay. with this. I can go ahead and update it and have it ready. Okay, so. that'd be great. <coughs> okay. Then that way it'll, it'll address that and we can we can have that available um, as well. Okay. And personnel is one of our biggest expenses. It is our biggest. It is our, biggest, it is our biz, biggest expense. It's our greatest resource. And um, as, as Nav indicated in his email and, and in other uh, opportunities where he's made comments, we, we want to have the best possible workforce of, of any city in the area. And this is a part of making that uh, a, a reality. I, I agree, certainly. And so from a budgeting standpoint, you would recommend either B or C? Is that what I heard you say? Because A is, at, under the circumstances of what you've proposed, A is not, um, I'm sorry, A, A is the, uh, the rates into effect October 11th, B is rates into effect January the 3rd, and C was April 7th. That's on the bottom of the sheet NAS that, sheet that there. Well, what bill rate would the interest rate get to A? The two. Instead of 1.5, mm -hmm. and and without a millage increase, I, I I don't know that we can do this at all. Um, and the other thing, and not to throw anything else in there, but we have an opportunity, and we sadly our budget year and the the um, grant date of awarding won't coincide to the point where we could go, oh, wow, we've got a build grant, and now we've got to do X. Well, one of the things that we may be able to to do is a build grant because we were very close last time. I'm hopeful we'll be close this time. And there's some matching that goes with that. So um, it doesn't get awarded until like the 1st of November. Um, and, and I think we can figure out how to do all that, but I just in, in the thought of what might be out there, if it's gonna be a huge impact for us, that's, um, that's a possibility from a, from a tax increase standpoint. So we got a lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff going on, but you know, making us the best place to, to live and to work in particular for our employees it's, it's part of it is the PERS mandate it's part of the the medical costs and just bringing people up to up to a, a standard that we, they want to work here so and we're, we're attractive for good people okay if nothing else then thank you both and now you've got a little bit to do and I don't think we gave you anything to do did we <laughs> okay well you just take the weekend off have, have a third day have a third day all righty, thank you so much for being here, seriously. We appreciate the study and, and we appreciate you being here. So, okay. And now, would you be so kind, this turnover rate deal, if you would email that out to the board, because I'm sorry, I was planning on passing it on and, and not springing it on anybody, but I forgot to, so my bad. All right, thank you. All right, so having gone through that, we now have the agenda items, and we do have kind of a long agenda, so, you know, eat a good lunch before Tuesday. Uh, minutes are set, Chris, and both of those are yes, ma'am. Are good. So, it consent on any of that? Speak up if anybody doesn't. I'm sorry. Did you not get an agenda? Oh, there you go. Sure. Sorry about that. Um, there are the minutes for the August 6th meeting and the August 16th work session. So, put a consent on those. Um, I will have new employee introductions. Does anyone on board have anything they wish to highlight as a part of the um, board comments? No. Okay. Uh, public appearance, we will have the Boys and Girls Club. Um, Nadia is going to come make a 10 minute or so. I'm not sure how long it is, but she's got 10 minutes to, to provide us. And I'm sure there'll be some questions associated with that. Um, and then we have the um, approval of the approval and um, report from the Student Association regarding their distribution, use and distribution of the 2% funding that they get for the university. So that is an annual requirement that they are, they are here to make that presentation and meet. We're going to have a public, in, uh, public hearing on the tax increment financing plan for Garen, and then a second public hearing on the budget and tax millage for the city of Starkville. We had our first one, as y'all recall, uh, last time. Do and we, I, Do we want to do the vote there with it, or do we want to do it under board business? Um, at, we can do well, whatever you would like to do. And if you'd like to do consideration and adoption of, then we can certainly, do, or not consideration, but uh, public hearing and adoption of, you can certainly do that. That's, that's good. Okay. Anybody have an objection to doing that as a part of the public hearing piece? You're talking about item A and B? 
uh, the under public hearing, we've got the second public hearing for the, you know, sometimes we'll take a public hearing and then do the, oh, yeah. do the action. I'm saying that you're talking about both on the board business, both item A and B. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, millage and the budget? Is that what you're talking about, Sandra? Okay, so yes. Put A and B in there. We can do it all as, as one um, statement, can we not? Or does it need to be separated out? Can, as long as you have the public hearing and then... Sure, okay. And have Lisa, you want to put those two together in one nice long statement. It, it'll make the budget, the, the meeting look like it's a little shorter. Um, okay, so we'll do that. And then we have, um, under Mayor's Business, this is the fun part. I get to report a positive closeout on the, on the mill parking garage. And if y'all recall, when the parking garage was done, it was a grant. And we had to meet uh, low to moderate income job creation. And then we had to meet other, other requirements. And we have, through a hard work from the city clerk, hard work from Ms. Benson from the uh, GTPDD, we have, um, what do I want to say, we have uh, um, identified those jobs and we've certified those jobs and we are now in a position to close this out. And the reason that's such good news is because we, ha if we hadn't done that, we'd be paying back for a garage. <laughs> so $6 million doesn't strike me as something we want to be paying back on. So this is, a, this is great news, guys. So um, I would love that to be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> the, the jobs so. created and all are in the packet also. Yes, yeah. And, and it really was. It was a it was a long, laborious process. We had gotten to the end. We had asked them to extend it, and they did. I think we had just one extension, didn't we, Lisa? Did we have more than one? So anyway, we worked worked hard to get it done, and I'm I'm really proud that the, that we were able to manage that. So, all right, the next one is a special event, which we will obviously not put on consent, but it's the homecoming parade. And then we just moved those two. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Don't put those two together. That tight together in that budget. And, oh, you want them separate? Okay. Okay, so you want to just leave them where they are then? All right. All right, let's we'll pull that back then. Um, all right, Lisa, never mind. They're close. Okay. Um, concerning, and this, this item is, uh, has been asked for by uh, uh, Vice Mayor Perkins, and so I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, I'm guessing it may have something to do with Bulldog Bash, but he has not been forthcoming with that. Um, so there's no information on them. No, sir. Not that I'm aware of. You didn't receive anything from Vice Mayor Perkins, no, did sir, you? I, I'm, no, okay. sir. No, he is. He is holding that one close to the vest. Um, and under D, it's consideration of resolution for the general obligation public park improvement bonds. We will not put that on consent. That is at a $25 million, and that's an absolute maximum. Uh, with not to exceed 30 years and if there are any questions on that both Nick Shore and Lynn Norris are here as well as the um, budget chair she's been dealing with the numbers and dollars and that sort of thing and, so if anyone has and, any questions and we've set that at, at a maximum we have no intention of approaching that number but it keeps us from coming back and having to do another resolution if something should change Right. If, if we have more income than we expected or something and we wanted to add something on. So it just gives us more um, more flexibility. And Mississippi Development Bank is what sets the maximum? Maximum 30. on the, the length of the term. That, that and the useful life of the assets will, will ultimately drive that What that do you, you think so, the realistic numbers are? Right. Yes. Um, I mean, you, if that's a... I, I, I don't have a good number on what we think the, the cornerstone is going to be, but my guess is that 25 years is the term that we're more likely looking at. So. And of that, what percentage is cornerstone and what is the <coughs> part? Is it 80 20? Is it 90 10? I mean, this is also park renovations, correct? Yes. yes. It, well, all right. So. And we're gonna, they're going to be coming, uh, Dallas Thomas is going to be coming on our next meeting, which would be this the September 17th meeting. They'll be coming to present that present the plan. Um, obviously, it's phased, and so we, we won't know how much it is until we get into the construction element of it. So they're going to present a plan. They're going to have add-ons and that sort of thing. Um, so we don't, bottom line is we don't know, but we have a, have a number because we need to save some for operations, and we need to save some for McKee and Sportsplex. And I think there might be another opportunity out there for something else, um, depending, on, depending on what's going on. Um, there may be some other park elements that we can do something with. So, what are you thinking? Um, something light bulb went off in your head. I know you said well, something that you were well, about. it did, and, and and so well, let's go ahead. I'll just, I'll just. This is public government. We're going to talk about it. Uh, Miss Colomb is coming to us 
on Tuesday asking about uh, additional funding for the Boys and Girls Club. They're interested in, moving, interested in moving up to J.L. King Park, which I think is a great place for them. They have asked Briar Jones to look at the building, and he has looked at the building, keeping the building as it is and then adding to it so there'll be something to be useful for them. I don't mean to be excluding you from mm -hmm. the discussion. Um, and so, you know, they need about, last I heard it was like two million or something from what Briar was saying to meet the Boys and Girls Club thing. And I thought, you know, if, and that's a park, and we own it, and if there is a way to pull back a little bit of that money, like maybe a million or so, and encourage them to uh, raise the other part that they need, then maybe there's a way for us to have that Boys and Girls Club up there at the J.L. King Park Center. Because right now, they are paying a fairly stout amount for rent, including, or not including their utilities, which they also pay, and they're looking to do a new building and have been for several years now. I'm just thinking that that might be something that'd be worth exploring. So. You know, it's just it's just one of those things that uh, I think we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't preclude. I, I think it's an idea, and I think that's the right area for them. I think it'd be an addition to the community up there. I think that's a good location for them, and they've identified it as a good location. And it's just something for us to to think about. So y'all chew on that. What about the championship field? Did that get nixed off of the? It is an it is an ad an ad. What do you call is it? Ad phase on two ad, or yeah, and I'd say the the most recent discussion that the amongst the consultants that we, we hired was that uh, championship field. They thought they liked the concept of that, um, but that very few teams are actually going to play on the championship field. And would you are you better off n not having the championship field and having maybe two additional fields to to play on? And so I think that's what they're going to present when they come back is what does that look like and, and how much is that going to be? To give you a, a number, I mean, I think we're, I think to, to make the numbers work, to make sure you have enough for Sportsplex and McKee and the other things that we're looking at, I mean, I think the target that we're hoping for is somewhere between 14 and 18 cornerstones, um, and then uh, the remainder would be left to there, whatever that remainder is, and I think we're, what at currently what uh, Alderman Sistrunk has feels comfortable that uh, that this uh, the one percent and the other will do along with operations is somewhere in that 22 million range if if things come in if we get good bids then you know there, there may be more opportunity to do some other things where you begin to entertain other other options or if the the prices on the fields come in a little less maybe you're able to do a little more at all, all of the parks and so um, I think there, the discussion has been, at least on that championship field, about um, where, where does that go and what, do you, what does that really look like in terms of use. And I think that's when they come at their next meeting, I think that's what they're going to present. So no discussions have, been, have taken place on as far as itemized lists since we met in this room the last time? Or have y'all continually, I know we talked about one as an example of a $150,000 playground at Cornerstone versus a $450,000 playground. So have y'all said anything else in the, the, down that list? Have there been more discussions with Dal Hoff Thomas on kind of prioritizing? You know that day we had some discussion on. Yeah, I would say, I would say the only time. discussion that uh, we had Dal Hoff Thomas and the two consultants we had one on the phone. Um, yeah, the Quill, oh, uh, John McDonald. John McDonald that we hired, and then David Aquila was here in person, and there were some. They were trying to Dal Hoff Thomas was trying to nail down some field sizes and that kind of stuff based on the discussion that you all had had that day and then hearing what the consultants had to say. So there had been some discussion there and it was a, for them uh, to talk with the consultants um, about where they thought the other amenities uh, needed to be. There wasn't a dollar amount necessarily put to those, but it was trying to, trying to nail down some of those amenities. So spray park, playground, you know, making sure Zip you have Wi-Fi. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was those kind of things that y'all had talked about. They were just trying to to firm that up, I think, so they could go get some better estimates. Right. So little little stuff, but still, you know, until we get to the point where we know what those construction costs are going to be, we're not going to know exactly what we're going to be able to do. And maybe you scale back one to do something else. So I think it's still going to be a flexible until we get to that point. Um, but I, I will look forward to what they're what they're going to bring bring forward um, the next. Tour. We'll have them in a work session. And then we'll have the the so Tuesday good. night. Yeah, they're going to be they're going to be at both places. So I think there's some opportunities there, and I and I do think that the um, 
the park options are broader necessarily than, than we might have thought based on some savings associated with uh, taking the turf and taking it offline and, and not going through the contractor so where they add 10 percent here or whatever you know just taking some of that um, that we're doing ourselves instead of just blanket putting it out there so they do some pretty serious cost savings that can go with that and the, and the bond market I, I, oh, yeah. I think the, the bond market rates. is yeah. very helpful to us in, in, in maximizing our dollars right now. So that's one reason we're continuing to move forward with the bonds, even though we don't know exactly where those numbers are going to peg, um, but, but just have things in place so that when we're ready to move forward, we don't have to wait through various waiting periods and miss an opportunity to get and I guess great I rates. One of my concerns is you put a cap like 20, or, you know, 25 million based on the annual or the number of years through Mississippi Development Bank. But you know, at what point do you come in and say it's not going to be any more than 22 million? Is it, you know, and I know how these things go, and you start having change orders, and you know this gets tacked on, this gets tacked on. But does every time the difference between the 22 and the 25, does every every time we have to have a change order, it'll come obviously in front of the full board and get approval for this. Any, in any and expenditure or any bond issuance would have to be approved by the board, absolutely. Sure. And I don't under, you know, and if, if 25 is, is a made up number that we know will be sufficient for the, the construction, why stop it? 25 why not do 30 or you know because what we can well what at we some can point we can't at some on, point we can't it's solely sustain based more. on and explain that i think we spoke on that it's more based on the maximum number of years allowed more than is and go ahead explain where the 25 came from this is nick the 25, nick short, okay. yeah. the years 25 million i mean the years of the million which which i'm talking about the 30 years 25 million like yeah, so the years are structured based off of general obligation Bonded debt law says you can only go 20 years. Mississippi Development Bank is a kind of issue gets you 30 years. So that's why 30 years just matches what the statutory language says. Okay. Not intention issue about 30 years, it's somewhere inside of that realm. The dollar amount we talked about was could you could you go up to 30 million, 35 million, 100 million? Sure. Right? And the city takes that decision what the city wants to do. Now, we don't anticipate the borrowing to come out to be anywhere near those levels through the multiple different phases, right? So Cornerstone Park gets bid out, construction patch comes out, and we're gonna issue, well, assume to issue that exact amount of money, right? Then you have the other parks that are getting done. After that construction time phase comes up, issue out the next set of packages from there. Um, but right, I mean, 25 million is a number that was kind of built around some of the sales tax revenues, a few other things that are inside of there. Where do you think the city would be comfortable committing itself to a, a level of that amount? Uh, I mean, could you afford more than that? Decisions up to the city. Um, but it, it's, it's not sort of a made up number. It's a number that gives us a reasonable expectation that the revenues could generate. Thank you. That, that and really a maximum of what we're likely to spend. I, I don't, uh, I, again, I don't think we're going to approach that number, but. One thought to kind of maybe help you, as I understood your question, the term of the bond, the interest rate on that bond, and the revenue stream or the revenue allocated to it will determine the amount or the size of the bond issue. Yeah. So if we have yeah. X in the revenue, you know what the other two are if we can size it. And that's what's that's what the you know been asked that question a couple times. Yeah, so. no, sure, absolutely. Well it's it's you know, how much how much do we think that we are comfortable? Because you don't want to, you know, you don't want the city in a bad position, but at the same time we don't want to leave some funding on the table where we could have done some things that would have been um, even more beneficial in terms of um, what we want to do from a, a recreation or a, or a tournament aspect. And we've got other parks that obviously phase one, phase two, depending on how we do it. Um, phase one's cornerstone, phase two can't start until after cornerstone's done because we're not going to pull fields out of, you know, Sportsplex or the McKee Park until we can move them to somewhere. So it's a, it's a long life to this, um, but we, you know, that's kind of the, got to get started somehow. Any, any other questions of either Nick or Lynn Watt or anybody else for that matter? So comments or anything? Okay. No? Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Next item is uh, the, the TIF for Garen. Um, that'll be 
that, that paperwork is in the in the, in the packet packets, and is. you're good with those those have been modified appropriately and, so. and what this is guys is last meeting we had the debate about calling for the public hearing now we're going to have the public hearing and this is just the official adoption of the plan following the public hearing okay um and following that with the 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 redevelopment well wait a minute reimbursing the developer for certain costs this is the tiff one's the adoption and implementation of the plan the other one is the reimbursement agreement that's right okay. that, that's the key right. that's I always get confused because they separate them out i think it ought to all be in one fell swoop but okay so it's two separate actions okay um airports nothing community development we have code enforcement which is uh and I, and I guess i'll have to take a hit on this i didn't realize there was a deadline in terms of taking action on a 21 1911 action that we took um, last year and there is a year window in which you have to get it done and we did not go ahead and, and get it done so this is calling for public hearing to determine that the 109 Roosevelt Taylor senior drive uh, which used to be Beatty Street is a menace and then calling for the 307 Apple Street as a menace um, so we're having to recycle through that and I apologize I just didn't as I said I just didn't realize it was a one-year window there but we will as soon as we get this done we will get it done this time around um, and under planning we have so anybody pro have a problem with putting that on consent both of them are just they're repeats both, of what we've done before public hearings. Uh, no it's calling for a public hearing so it's just it's just yeah, the calling for we'll have the public hearings mm -hmm. next time but this is just the calling for so if everybody's good with that uh, consideration of the development agreement um, for the Vista and that'll take some explaining. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kim, do you want to put a little bit of that in front of us now so we can be? Yes, this is just to provide the timely issuance of the certificate of occupancy for each building. Because of the, uh, the size of the construction work, uh, what has been done on the property was uh, they got the preliminary plat done and uh, infrastructure has to be laid. Uh, usually they finish the final lines and plat and record it and then go for the building permit but in this case they were uh, went for the building uh, development uh, first so uh, infrastructure laid in at the same time building was constructed now they want to get a, a, a temporary seal for each building but final plat has not been done so we cannot actually issue the building permit uh, you know, certificate of occupancy for each building so this instrument actually uh, development agreement allows uh, us to actually issue the temporary uh, certificate of occupancy uh, if they meet uh, what kind of infrastructure need to be done for each building and what has to be assured for safety issues and that it those are in the development agreement so if we pass this they can do it on a building by building basis Yes. Because right now they've got it, the temporary seal for one, right? Building one? Yes, because it is one lot right, right. now. So <laughs> we could be able to issue one uh, temporary seal, but uh, not for the second one. Right. Okay, so this allows as they continue to finish the other, how many? Four buildings? The four buildings. The four buildings. Right. As they continue to finish the buildings, allow them? Okay. D Dr. Kim, I'm willing to entertain this as an option. Um, Will you be able to, to communicate with the board um, that the construction up to this point that they have met um, the requirements of the plan that as was approved by through the development review committee from both an engineering and the actual building components um, before we start uh, contemplating giving them uh, leeway uh, into helping them get temporary COs or other COs on a lot by lot basis. I'm unwilling to do that if they're not holding up their part of the bargain and doing what they said that they were going to do and what was approved. Yes. So, so if you can make sure that you uh, are able to outline that for us at the meeting on Tuesday, this would be something I yes, would I present. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Any other questions to Dr. Kim about this project? Okay. Um, and then the other one is consideration of calling for the first public hearing for the adoption of the place type mats. So this is another thing that's a good deal, y'all. We have, we are, we are now getting some tangible evidence of, of the timeline associated with the unified code, the place type maps. So we're looking at a, um, at a completion um, of December the 17th, which is our last meeting of the year, of this calendar year, in getting this done and the unified code adopted. And I think we're on target for that. Dr. Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, 
we're on target for that December 17th um, yes. um, final. We are actually aiming for, I got something on the schedule. Yeah, uh, with the, there is a three part. The first one is a place time map updates for the conference plan. And second one is a public input sessions for the uh, unified development code. And third one is the unified development code adoption. Now first, uh, for the place type map amendment, there will be the core four meeting on September 3rd, which will be the next one. And then October 1st, uh, we're gonna have a public, uh, the first public hearing. And October 15th, we're gonna have a second public hearing. And for the public input sessions, uh, we are going forward to September 17th, that is the core four meeting. And uh, October 3rd, uh, it will be the first uh, the public input session. And October 17th, that will be the second public input session. For the actual public hearings to adopt the uh, Unified Development Code, um, October 15th will be the core for meeting. Uh, and then uh, November 12th, uh, it will be discussed at the Planning and Zoning Commission. And uh, uh, December 3rd, there will be the fir first public hearing. and then. Uh, December 17th, there will be the second public hearing and uh, adoption, if possible. So we're going to have uh, public input hearings, meetings, as well as public hearings at the board meetings. And one of them we're going to schedule for the sportsplex, and the other one we're going to schedule for here, so that we'll have you know two locations around town that people can come to, and we can provide that information. And we want to make sure we get it out there so all our social media folks and all the you know newspaper and all those things, we'll put that timeline out on Tuesday. Yes. We'll firm that up and put that out on Tuesday so everybody can uh, can put that on their calendars and, and tell your friends and neighbors to come and give us input. So, okay. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Appreciate I'm about it. To step out, so. Okay. All right. Thank you. See you on Tuesday. All righty. See you going to the game tonight? Man. Going to the game tonight? Oh, yeah. All right. Good. Good. See you tonight. Uh, okay, and then uh, on planning, um, well, any issue with calling for the public, first public hearing? I mean, we can still have a presentation because I think it's important to put that timeline out there. So, um, under we claims docket, it's typical, and then we have approval of the fiscal year source of supply bids. Consent on that one? Any issues? Uh, fire department is a reimbursement for summer classes, and then permission to construct a dirt pad for fire station five. Any issues on either one of those? Okay. Consent on those. Uh, HR is the approval of the salary adjustments. Obviously, not a consent item, but that'll be coming up under HR. Um, authorization to hire an uh, entry fire, entry level firefighter should be consent. Any issues? Somebody say something if not. Um, hiring uh, uh, John Javante Harris. Did I say that right? Javante Harris is a maintenance worker too in sanitation. Uh, consent on that, and then authorization to hire Noah Brandon, the civil engineer intern in the engineering department. Issues on any of those? Okay, IT. We have a we have a long, a long-standing work order on municipal uh, or security camera policy, and then on the social media policy. The social media policy has been kind of hanging around out there for a while, so um, that'll be something for everybody to look at. And I, I'm going to let Joel, wherever he is, make a. There he is down there. I forget about you being down there. Make a presentation on that, and Mav can, Nav can help him if we have any questions Definitely. about it. But be glad so, to. Okay, we'll leave those that way. Uh, police department is uh, allowing uh, lethal instructor course training, and then renewal agreement with Pine Lake Church, which is the same thing that we did. It's just an annual renewal. Is that correct? That's Mr. correct. Okay. Sanitation department. We've got our our bags to advertise for, and then um, declaring surplus equipment. So that we can sell it and help pay for those bags, <laughs> or actually, in this case, a mower. So um, we have a we have a mower. Our our tractor. Uh, Calvin, correct me if I'm wrong. Our tractor is like 20 something years old. It's a 1993, and uh, it is it is costing us a lot of money every time we turn around to get it fixed. So we need to we need to give Calvin some more equipment. New for, equipment for, for landscaping. For landscaping, and yes. Was, I, I thought there was some discussion of two um, tractors, or right now, it's one, it's one. right now just one. It's just one. Yeah. Right now. He's still keeping the other one together with baling wire. Well, that's what I know. <laughs> <laughs> but just, but we're gonna we're gonna let Calvin make his call okay. when he's ready for the for okay. the new ones. But uh, as it stands right now, there is a mower that he has uh, 
had demoed to him and I saw it working out on Stark Road. Looks like it will do the job and it's got what a five year warranty, was that right Calvin? Yes ma'am. Had a really decent warranty. So, um, and beautification is one of those things that's important to us. So, um, anyway, any issue with that? Put that on consent? Okay. Utilities is uh, water division. We've got a couple of surpluses um, under one and two, and then uh, other others under three as well. And Mr. Forrester to travel to San Antonio. Um, a rental agreement for I didn't. I tried to read this during the department meeting and thought I was. We just came out wrong. So it's a. It's to buy stuff for Terry that Terry needs for for the uh, whatever. So. Uh, it's a flex drive, hot dipped, galvanized, horizontal floating brush rotor. <laughs> it's, for it's for the wastewater plant. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then to accept Hawk, Hawk SCADA uh, is the, was the only company to submit a proposal on the SCADA uh, maintenance and support services. The other one is to enter into a long term power contract. And as Chris said, this is a big deal, but it's about the only deal we got. Yeah. Obviously, TBA is our, is our provider. And they are doing a, a deal uh, that is a 20-year deal with a 20-year opt-out. So basically, we're doing a 40-year deal with DBA. But it apparently is a very good deal in terms of rates and that sort of thing. So, um, and Terry, stand up and tell me if I'm wrong. It's a good deal for rates. I, that's right. I, I think this really tries to address rate stability for the long-haul partnership of public power with TBA. And there's got commitments to do that. We do have some ways to get off rates change a lot but I think as the mayor said earlier too uh, if you looked at a long-term arrangement for a power supply into the future uh, you know TVA and the rest of the distributors that are doing TVA uh, it's, it's a real good deal staying together because you know, our options aren't there but, uh, well and TVA has we been a good partner rate, we do get some rate incentives there's not going to be any rate adjustment this fall we've done those in the past on a small basis there won't be any in right now that intends not to have any for the next five years so, okay. that's another good so okay. Good All right. Well, this is one of those that um, I, it is. It just is what it is. TVA is our partner. So, and uh, Mr. Latimer has vetted it and says that the the agreement is properly legal. It, it is legal. <laughs> and, and, yes. And so, um, I would suggest consent for this one as well. Um, upgrade mobile three one one. This is just to make it more robust. And, and user friendly across all the department right now is targeted primarily to the water and the sewer side. Right. This allows us to do all utilities and, and clearly better reporting. And it's kind of the next, uh, the next okay. evolution. Well, I think this is a really good thing because 311 was one of those things that we worked on. Well, actually, I worked on it very long, long time ago when I was in a different role. And uh, um, Commissioner Presley was very instrumental in getting 311 for us. And so I think this is a good to be able to expand it. So. I would suggest consent for that one. And then authorization to proceed for emergency purchase. If everyone recalls that we were out of water last week, this was uh, part of uh, a necessitated emergency repair for, um, for that water leak. So this is an emergency, emergency purpose. We don't have any reason to have to do anything other than just approve it, right? We don't have to do any kind of public acknowledgement. No, because the, the finding is mentioned in the agenda item. Okay. So if you want to put it on a consent, you can. Okay. Yes, sir. How does that work, Chris, with as far as the contract to cut the line and we're going to all the expense? You know, we just paved the blocks away and now it's got road issues, under underlaying issues under the road, the road bed. And you can't put that back like it was a month earlier with brand new. They're going to cut it and it's never the same. And where does that leave us? Are, they, are we going to just have to put the bill and live with that? I don't, I don't know because I haven't been involved in the day to day on how that line was cut and what we did. I just don't know enough facts to well, make the opinion right now. We need to look at the yeah. franchise agreement because it's, it's a big expense we're about to be going through. I'll look at that. Yeah. I no, have no, asked. No, no, no part of our you know, negligence. Right. And I have asked Terry to gather his costs on doing that. I think he says it's 50, under a little under 50 or? Should be under 50. Yeah, should be under 50. Of course, there are always the, the things that are not dollar value like the the road and that sort of thing which an inconvenience to our restaurants and all those sorts of things but uh, I think we're, we're going to be guided by the franchise agreement but but I have gotten a call from Atmos who on more than one occasion twice after this happened and and they she said that we're gonna you know Atmos is gonna stand by it we'll make it right well, now I don't know what make it right means but that's what they said. Bill. and I and I appreciate that and uh, what I would also say is that we've been waiting for a long time 
for that TAP project to get approved for that road that was in terrible condition. That is a primary entrance into Mississippi State University, and we got, we're a week away from our first home football game. Um, whatever it needs to be for a temporary fix or to have this work done sooner rather than later, the intersection at Loxley Way in South Montgomery is a, is a, is a crater. It's worse, it is in worse condition than it was before the road is repaid. Um, and so whether or not the city attorney or who needs to get involved, what we need to, Atmos needs to, to, to work with some uh, diligence in making sure that this happens sooner rather than later and done to the level of what we expect it uh, to be done to to be able to maintain over the, the long haul. Because right now, uh, you know, there's a, there's a good section of road right there that has been significantly impaired. Um, and just coming in and putting a little hot mix over the top and yeah. saying you, you fix the problem is not, so will not be sufficient. Uh, to that end, Edward, would that be something that uh, you would be able to evaluate the quality of the road as it currently exists based yeah. on how yeah, it was? I, I can give a brief update on that. I actually spoke with one of the BPs from Atlas today okay. about the road and getting it back to a pre uh, it's utility a, cut state and uh, they, they committed to me on the phone that they were going to do that. They are hiring a local engineer to develop a plan um, to fully remedy everything that you talked about on the little. We had some undermining of the roadway under the roadbed. We had temporarily just kind of put it back so we could get the traffic back open. So we'll be opening all that up and we're hearing it from the ground up. And obviously that's going to be some impact to not only the surface but also all of the striping and the curb and gutter and and uh, and I understand what you're saying about a, a it, what I'm saying is that is the longer term fix and that's the way it needs to be done for the story but there's also some short term things that we need to get done in place within the next week when we have a huge traffic load coming in next weekend we will do everything we can to try to get them to do that between now and then. Did he give you a timeline when you talked to him? The, the timeline that we talked about generally is the first thing we need to do is develop a plan to repair. And I know that they have reached out to a local engineering firm today, and a matter of fact, because they, they reached out to me and asked kind of what we were generally thinking on that. Um, but I will continue to stress a sense of urgency because not only does this impact our roadway, we had our final walkthrough yesterday on the Locksley Taft project that you were referencing. And one of the things that MDOT's going to require us to do is to get all of that roadway fixed and fully repaired before they're going to close it. <coughs> so that will impact our ability on that project too. Okay. Well, are they putting that in writing? Yes. Okay. MDOT? Yes. Yes. Well, I want to make sure that's part of that, that paper trail that yes, goes to Atlas. It will be on the final punch list okay. from our inspection yesterday. Okay. If any other departments were impacted other than Terry's department then put together some sort of cost associated with it. Uh, police department was was party party to that. I don't know if the fire department was as well, but let's put together some cost impact associated with that, please. Okay. All right. Um, all we have left is we've got personal matters. I don't know what those are. Again, that would be a vice mayor, and then we have pending litigation. What are we? Oh, finishing up. Okay. okay. Yes. All right, guys. Anything else before we go? All right, we got a Go Jackets and a Hail State and a long weekend. So everyone have a great weekend and thank you very much. Try to be good. All right. Well, just a reminder sure. that sanitation is going to pick up citywide Tuesday. 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 That's correct. Sanitation pick up citywide Tuesday.